Upon entering my new school, I sensed the imminent shift in my surroundings. Having been born and bred in Philly, relocating an hour away from the bustling city was bound to require some adaptation. And by adaptation, I mean embracing the change with open arms. At the behest of my father and the persistence of my mother, I diligently kept myself out of trouble, steering clear of any unnecessary entanglements. The demographic makeup of the area was quite diverse. A mix of blacks, Hispanics, Italians, Jews, and predominantly hard-nosed Dutch descendants. They weren't of the Amish or Mennonite stock, but rather staunch German Lutherans who held sway over the locality. Despite the eclectic blend, I found it relatively easy to blend in, although I couldn't help but long for the camaraderie of my Philly friends. Post-graduation, I opted to stay put, primarily to remain close to my family. Yet, I still made regular sojourns back to my old neighborhood, keeping the ties strong with my childhood companions. My foray into the workforce commenced with a job driving a fuel oil delivery truck. Over time, I transitioned to an indoor role, handling dispatch and orders. It became apparent that I had a natural aptitude for the industry, and I could envision myself as the proprietor of a similar venture in the not-so-distant future. Forming friendships with individuals of the opposite sex came effortlessly to me, and my social life exceeded my expectations. When I tied the knot, my mother harbored a slight disappointment that my spouse, Alina, wasn't of Italian descent. However, she made every effort to ensure that Elena was warmly embraced without any reservations. After the arrival of our two children, Elena advocated for me to undergo a vasectomy. I had no objections to the idea. But as the children started school, Elena expressed her desire to re-enter the workforce. My father held the belief that it wasn't ideal for a wife and mother to pursue a career outside the home. While I couldn't entirely grasp the reasoning behind his stance at the time, upon reflection, it seemed to align with certain traditional values. It wasn't that I objected to Elena's decision to work, but rather I felt uncomfortable with the idea of her socializing extensively with people from her past, some of whom I didn't particularly care for. During her school days, Elena was deeply involved in various extracurricular activities, which she thoroughly enjoyed. Conversely, I steered clear of such engagements and the individuals associated with them, perceiving them as elitist cliques focused on mutual admiration. Although both Elena and I had experienced previous relationships, we never broached the topic, simply falling into a tacit understanding not to delve into our respective pasts. After a decade of marriage, cracks began to surface in our relationship. Elena had been diligently working in the claims department of a local national insurance company. My concerns heightened when she started clocking in overtime and sacrificing weekends for work. It was six months later when the breaking point became unmistakably clear to me. It was when the seminar came into the picture. Marco, I don't understand what the issue is. It's just three days. I've already arranged for your mom to look after the kids while I'm away. You'll be home in the evenings. You can handle cooking for yourself, Alina argued, seemingly oblivious to my growing unease. I couldn't believe she had the audacity to even ask. Who else is attending the seminar? I inquired, trying to maintain composure. Her demeanor brightened a bit as she responded, six girls from the department, Vivian Wright from Personnel, and Derek. A smile crept onto my face upon hearing his name. It was astounding that she hadn't realized I was aware of her clandestine lunches and late-night work sessions with her immediate superior, Derek Torres. Derek and Elena share a history, having grown up together. He was the epitome of the overachiever in school, involved in every club and activity except sports. Do you think I'm some kind of fool, Elena? I snapped, my frustration palpable. Confusion flickered across her face. I don't understand. What are you talking about? She replied innocently. I've known about you and Derek for six months now. If you think I'm going to let you go away with him for three days, you're out of your mind. I retorted, my tone tinged with bitterness. Marco, you're misunderstanding. Derek is my boss. There's nothing going on between us. I would never cheat on you. You know that, she protested, her eyes pleading for understanding. I glanced down at the empty Budweiser can in my hand, my grip tightening involuntarily. Slowly, I rose from my chair and made my way to the kitchen. 
With a clenched fist, I crushed the thin aluminum and hurled it towards the trash can, missing by inches. The sound of the new can hissing as I popped the top echoed in the tense silence as I returned to my seat. You're a good mother to our children, Elena. That's the only reason you're still here. I've spoken to my mom about all of this. She advised me to stand firm and hope that you come to your senses for the sake of the kids. If I were to leave you, the courts would grant you custody. I can't let that happen, I explained, the weight of the situation heavy in the air. You told your mother I was cheating on you. Elena's voice wavered, disbelief etched across her features. No, a lady from church spilled the beans. I simply didn't deny it when she confronted me, I admitted coolly. Her eyes widened in shock. You can't be serious. I don't believe you. Why are you saying all this? She implored, desperation lacing her tone. Taking a hefty swig of beer, I couldn't help but smirk. Derek resides at 321 David Drive, just three blocks from your office. You and your boss frequent his place, usually three times a week, lingering for nearly three hours each visit. Care to enlighten me on what exactly goes on there for three hours? And while we're at it, care to explain the overtime you've been clocking at the office. Did you know your office clean lady also attends church with my mother? Tears welled up in her eyes, her lower lip trembling as she struggled to find words. As long as you refrain from publicly humiliating me or my family, I'll refrain from taking drastic measures. But if that changes, all bets are off. You can stay or you can leave, but you'll never take my boys from me, I declared firmly. With a mix of fury and anguish, Elena rose abruptly from her seat. Damn you, Marco. I hate you, she spat before storming out of the room, tears streaming down her cheeks. It was the first time she had ever sworn at me, and the first time she had uttered derogatory remarks about my heritage. The duchy in her had finally surfaced. We had two boys, Harry and Jack, who shared a room with a set of bunk beds. The third bedroom served as a catch-all space. That's where I ended up sleeping from that point onwards. It was a rented house. Despite having over $60,000 saved for a down payment on our dream home, my dreams had turned into a nightmare. The seminar incident was never brought up again. Elena ceased working over time and started bringing her lunch to work. The atmosphere at home wasn't just chilly, it was icy and frigid. My mom hadn't received any new intel from her church acquaintances. Things appeared to be returning to normal, but I couldn't shake off the discomfort. There was a noticeable absence of intimacy, and I knew I couldn't endure that situation for much longer. Despite my reservations, I reluctantly agreed to accompany Elena to her company Christmas party. I didn't want to leave her to attend alone, and I figured I could pass the evening quietly by simply staying out of the way. It seemed like a good plan at the time, but it was riddled with flaws. The company had rented out a spacious hall equipped with a dance floor, a lavish buffet table, and a couple of open bars. I could nurse three beers throughout the entire evening without feeling any adverse effects. When we arrived, the only available tables were situated near the company's top brass, conspicuously vacant as it seemed employees were deliberately avoiding those seats. Things appeared to be going smoothly for the first hour. I observed Derek across the room, casually mingling with his buddies. While several of Elena's colleagues invited her to dance, Derek remained conspicuously absent. I was more than happy to let her enjoy herself on the dance floor, as dancing wasn't my cup of tea. As I sipped on my third beer, I couldn't help but notice subtle exchanges of glances between Elena and Derek from across the room. It was mainly comprised of nods and subtle head tilts, but it was evident that something was brewing between them. I did my best to feign disinterest and boredom while discreetly keeping a watchful eye on their interactions. As my wife excused herself to visit the restroom, I quickly scanned the room and realized Derek was nowhere to be seen. It was baffling. After our heated discussion at home, it seemed utterly foolish for her to attempt a rendezvous with him while we were both in the same building. She could easily have met him at work without any risk of being caught. I couldn't shake the feeling that her motive was to humiliate me by flaunting her connection with Derek in front of everyone. By engaging with him at a company event, she would be publicly branding me as a cuckold. As Alana disappeared down the hallway towards the restrooms, Derek's cronies 
wearing smug grins, stood clustered by one of the bars. Before heading to the restroom myself, I made a detour to the head table. Leaning in, I offered a fog apology for any disruption, solely to attract their attention. The group across the room, previously sporting self-satisfied grins, now appeared unsettled. They seemed unsure of how to assist Derek in this unexpected situation. Entering the empty ladies' room first, I then ventured into the men's room. What I witnessed next unfolded in a blur of shock and anger. There they were, locked in an embrace. His back was to me, his hand creeping up her skirt. And to my dismay, there was no resistance from her. I seized Derek by the collar and forcefully shoved him against the wall, ignoring my wife's frantic cries echoing in the background. With a swift motion, I brought him to the ground. The once lively hall fell eerily silent as I dragged Direct to the center of the floor by his tie. The orchestra had halted their music, and all eyes were fixed on the unfolding scene. Surveying the room, I noted the absence of any offers of assistance for Direct. I apologize for disrupting your festivities. I'll be taking my leave now, but feel free to entertain yourselves with my unfaithful wife. I declared, the bitterness in my tone palpable. As Direk struggled to rise to his hands and knees, Elena stood in the doorway, her expression a mix of shock and disbelief. It was unclear whether her distress was directed at what I had done to her lover or the humiliating declaration I had made to her colleagues. Frankly, it didn't concern me. Observing Direk positioned directly beneath the mistletoe, a sudden impulse overtook me. Before departing, I delivered a sharp kick, ensuring he wouldn't forget the encounter anytime soon. He crumpled to the ground in agony, yet not a single word was uttered by the onlookers. I phoned my mom from the car, requesting her to swing by the house to pick up the boys. The notion of going out of town for a few days felt like a necessary escape, and I had no intention of leaving the kids with their mother. I doubted she'd be in any state to care for them properly. Driving aimlessly, I found myself formulating plans without a clear destination in mind. Thankfully, my boss didn't object to granting me a week off. Upon my arrival home, my parents were already there. After settling the babysitter's fees, I assisted in preparing the boys for their grandmother's care. My hastily packed bag consisted mostly of socks and underwear, with a few shirts and pants thrown in just in case. Before departing, I retrieved the cash box from the basement rafters. Given the paltry interest rates offered by banks, I had opted to keep the $62,000 stash at home. Admittedly, it may seem foolish, but it was a trait I inherited from my mom, who used to keep sizable stashes scattered throughout her kitchen. As I went about turning off the lights, a taxi pulled up, depositing Elena at the doorstep. She entered wordlessly, sinking onto the couch without a sound. Her expression was more one of concern than anger, more troubled and fearful. I made it clear, didn't I? Just one rule. Don't embarrass me or my family in public, but you couldn't resist, could you? I uttered calmly, watching as tears welled in her eyes before turning and walking out the door. It was a little after nine when I merged onto the Schoolkill Expressway. Well, that party didn't last long, for me, at least. I decided to spend a few days in Atlantic City before heading home, but first, I needed to catch up with my old friend Luca. Luca ran a sandwich shop in our old neighborhood. It wasn't one of those flashy places you see in Philly travel guides. Rather, it served as a local convenience for the nearby residents. His main source of income came from other ventures that most of us either overlooked or were involved in ourselves. He lived on the second floor and operated out of the back room. Meeting Luca felt like a trip down memory lane. After explaining my predicament, he agreed to lend a hand. Marco, it's going to cost you 20. Can you handle that? or do you need me to spot you? Luca inquired. I've got it up front. No problem, I replied confidently. Do you want it messy or quiet? Luca asked. Transparent. No fuss, no muss. Nothing, I asserted. You're leaving for a few days. Do you have anything set up? Luca inquired further. No plans. I was thinking of heading to Atlantic City, I responded. How about six days and seven nights at the Taj? Luca suggested. What are you talking about, Luca? I questioned. I've got some comps coming in. 
I think it would work out pretty well for you, Luca explained. Sounds good to me, I agreed. Are you going alone, Marco? Luca probed. Yeah, this was all sort of spur of the moment. I didn't have time to invite anyone, I admitted. You shouldn't be alone. You need somebody to help verify that you were there. Hold on a minute, Luca said before picking up the phone and dialing a familiar number. Bella, it's Luca. Make yourself pretty and get your ass down here. Luca instructed over the phone, then chuckled before continuing, No, nothing like that. You're going on vacation. Marco, do you remember Bella, my brother Michael's oldest? Luca asked me. Yeah, chubby little thing with dark brown eyes. I remember she was always laughing. How old is she now? I recalled. Luca smiled at my recollection of his niece. She's 23 now, Marco, and she ain't chubby anymore. Suddenly, it dawned on me that Bella would be joining me for the trip to the shore. The thought made me slightly uneasy, considering she was Luca's niece, but then again, he was the one orchestrating the whole thing. Marco, do you have a credit card? Luca inquired. I have two of them. I was planning to cancel them Monday morning, I replied. Don't do that. I want you to use those credit cards as much as possible. Meals out, room service, maybe even some casino cash advances, but don't go overboard. You need the credit card activity to prove you were there. Spread it out over time so it doesn't look like you snuck back home. It might cost you a couple of grand, but it's cheap insurance, Luca advised. Luca clearly knew his stuff. It all made perfect sense. As I contemplated his advice, Bella entered the room. Marco, I haven't seen you since you moved up to the sticks. You look great, Bella exclaimed. I now understood why Luca was smiling. Bella was stunningly beautiful. Her dark eyes were mesmerizing, and any remnants of baby fat she once had seemed to have relocated to her chest. In my flustered state, I clumsily knocked over my chair as I jumped to my feet. Marco needs someone to keep him company in Atlantic City for a few days. Are you up for it? Luca inquired. Her demeanor shifted slightly at his words. Aren't you still married? She questioned, turning her attention to me. Before I could respond, Luca intervened. The marriage is over, Bella. Marco needs a companion right now. I know you always liked him, so I thought of you first, Luca explained. Luca, I can't be a part of breaking up someone's family. It's not right for you to ask me to do this. Can't you just get one of the girls to accompany him? I protested. I'm not asking you to sleep with him. Just keep him company and help him forget his troubles, Luca reasoned. Bella's expression shifted as if she had just pieced something together. She was not only stunning, but also quick-witted. I'm sorry, she said, glancing between Luca and me with a small smile. I'd be happy to go with you, Marco, but you have to promise to buy me some saltwater taffy. We all shared a smile. I'll need about an hour to get ready. Luca, make sure he doesn't drink anything. I don't want to drive down there with a drunk, Bella instructed as she left to gather her things, perhaps giving me a playful wink. While Bella was away, Luca and I reviewed our conversation. He graciously accepted my $20,000 and assured me of his full commitment. The drive to Atlantic City was uneventful, except for the detailed rundown I provided Bella about the issues with Alina. Her only response was, oh, the poor kids. Bella frowned upon seeing the double beds in our room, but fortunately, she didn't notice my suppressed chuckle. I had a strong feeling that we'd only be using one of them before the week was over. All good things come in time. We dabbled in a bit of gambling, but kept it restrained. I was wise enough to understand that in the grand scheme, the odds were stacked against me. Bella was content with the quarter slots, while I simply sought a diversion. More often than not, we found ourselves relishing meals and strolling along the boardwalk, and naturally, we caught every show in town. The first night, I maintained my gentlemanly demeanor, but by noon on the second day, Bella and I were igniting sparks between the sheets. My mother had been right. I should have married an Italian girl. It felt effortless, and I didn't feel as though I was betraying anyone. As we were preparing for dinner on the fourth day, we received unexpected visitors. Two men, not in suits but in sports jackets, stood at our door. 
I'm Louise Coleman, and this is my partner, Oscar Jenkins. We're from the Berks County Special Crimes Task Force. Mind if we have a word with you, Marco Romano. Louise introduced them. Bella emerged from the bathroom in her undergarments, glancing over at the men before fetching her bathrobe from the bed. Though slightly embarrassed, she understood the gravity of the situation. Can you give me an idea of what we'll be discussing? I inquired. We'd like to discuss your connection with Direct Torres, Louis replied. I didn't have a relationship with Direct Torres. My wife did, I clarified. For some reason, they appeared slightly uneasy. Coleman took the lead in conversation while Oscar seemed preoccupied with staring at Bella. We understand, Mr. Romano. We're aware of the altercation you had with him last Friday at the Continental Insurance Christmas Party, Coleman explained. Is he pressing charges? I inquired. No, he's gone missing, and we were hoping you could assist us in locating him, Coleman replied. Gentlemen, before we proceed, I'd like to have someone from the Atlantic City Police Department present, and I don't mean just any officer. If you can't arrange that, I'll need a lawyer. My lawyer from reading, I asserted. There was no immediate response from my visitors. Bella, get dressed. We're heading out for supper. Apologies, gentlemen, but we have reservations at 6 o'clock. The stakes at the safari are outstanding. I may be available to speak with you this Friday if needed, I offered. They seemed taken aback by my response. Why do you suspect something happened to this guy? Maybe he simply left town for a while, I suggested. He was picked up by a cab leaving Community General Hospital on Sunday morning, and no one has seen him since, Coleman revealed. Bella had finished dressing, and I was slipping on my jacket. Well, I've been here since Friday night, and you can verify that with the hotel staff. Now, if you'll excuse me, we're off for a couple of steaks. Any further questions can wait until Friday, I stated firmly. Yes, we'll expect to see you then, Coleman responded. With a simple nod, I guided them towards the door. We rode down in the elevator together, but no more words were exchanged. When we reached the lobby, they headed towards hotel security, while Bella and I made our way to the safari. Harry and Jack greeted me enthusiastically when I arrived home, and the saltwater taffy I brought back only added to their joy. However, Elena seemed distant and chilly. It was evident she had no clue about the day's events. After my discussion with the police, I spent the rest of the afternoon with the boys and planned to have a conversation with Alina later that evening. The boys were settled in front of the TV for the evening, so I took a seat at the kitchen table, patiently waiting for Elena to finish cleaning up. She seemed to be taking longer than usual, but I remained seated, unmoved. Finally, she turned towards me and sat down, resting her elbows on the formica top. What did you do with Tarek? Her tone wasn't accusatory or angry, rather, she seemed genuinely concerned. Her gaze shifted between me and the room as she awaited my response. I was in Atlantic City all week. I haven't seen Direct since the party, I replied. You heard him, she stated matter-of-factly. I hope so, I responded bluntly. He was in the hospital for two days. You broke his jaw and his nose, she informed me. He deserved it. I retorted. She seemed to have run out of questions. What were you doing with him in the men's room? I pressed after a moment of silence. There was no response from Elena. She sat, wringing her hands and avoiding eye contact, fixated on the tabletop. Why did he have his hand up your skirt? I questioned, still met with silence. Why aren't you at work and why are the kids home on a school day? I queried further. I had to quit work. There was no way I could go back there again. I took the boys out of school because your mother said you might be home today, Elena confessed. It was time to address the issues head on. I made it clear, Elena, there was only one rule. Don't do anything that would humiliate me or my family. A straightforward rule. Why did you feel the need to break it? Both of you just seemed determined to rub it in. Why? I demanded, my frustration mounting with each word. Elena appeared increasingly nervous as we sat there. I slammed my fist onto the tabletop forcefully. I asked you why. Damn it, answer me, I insisted. I don't know why. I don't know why. It just happened. You were sitting there like a lost puppy, and we thought we could take advantage of the situation, 
We had no idea you would react like that. You went berserk. I was terrified, she confessed, her voice trembling with emotion. At least she was showing some emotion, but her explanation made no sense. I refused to dwell on it. It was foolish of them to choose that moment and that place to humiliate me. They had weeks to plan their rendezvous before the party, and I would have been none the wiser. No, their intention was clear, and Elena's excuses wouldn't change that fact. Elena, you have three options. You can choose to stay here and fulfill your responsibilities as a mother to your children. You can opt for a divorce and leave without custody of the kids, or you can simply vanish from our lives altogether. However, if you decide to stay, understand that we won't be living as husband and wife, and I won't tolerate any further affairs with Derek or anyone else, I stated firmly. At the mention of Derek's name, Elena broke into tears. Before she could make a decision, she fled from the room, sobbing uncontrollably. It seemed the conversation would have to be continued another day. Changes were made. I secured a small apartment a few blocks away from the house, close enough for the boys to visit whenever they wished. Bella moved in with me. The police interviewed me a few more times before ceasing their inquiries. Direct Torres had been last seen picked up by a taxi outside the hospital, but his whereabouts remained unknown. Despite his family offering a reward for any information, no leads were forthcoming. Every evening, I joined Elena and the boys for supper, and I made sure to spend quality time with my sons on the weekends. Despite still being legally married, it was evident to everyone that Elena and I were no longer a couple. She often visited her parents and sister, which didn't bother me. There were no signs of her seeing anyone else, though she had quit her job after the Christmas party and showed no interest in finding another. We never revisited the conversation we had the first night I returned home. Elena fulfilled her role as a devoted mother impeccably. The house was always tidy, the boys well-fed, and they consistently had clean clothes. I handled all the outdoor chores, ensuring the lawn and surroundings were well-maintained. Alana received a weekly allowance of $200 to cover household expenses, groceries, and personal needs. Despite my offer to provide more, she always declined. We no longer relied on credit cards. During Thanksgiving and Christmas, the boys and I spent time with my family, often accompanied by Bella. Alina typically spent the holidays with her own family, but made sure to join us on Christmas Eve to celebrate with the boys. Conversations about the relationship between their mother and me became awkward whenever Harry or Jack brought it up. Both Elena and I adamantly refused to engage in discussion on the matter with them. I appreciated her stance, but that again, what could she possibly say? The fatade continued for years, with my brief explanation hardly capturing the complexities of our situation. Constant complications and disagreements arose, yet somehow we managed to navigate through them. Initially, things were going well with Bella. However, as time passed, she began to spend more time with her family in Philly and less with me. I couldn't blame her. I was indebted to her for the efforts she made to ease the breakup. Despite the challenges, I found myself unable to divorce Elena, and as long as the boys were still at home, I couldn't bring myself to ask her to leave. These were self-imposed limitations, but ones I felt compelled to honor. I detested the entire situation, but I couldn't devise an alternative plan. However, the boys found a way to do just that. When Harry was 16, things reached a breaking point. A new student at his school, who happened to be related to my wife's former lover, deliberately provoked Harry about the situation. It was the first time this issue had ever surfaced, catching Harry off guard. Derek's nephew ended up in the hospital, and I received a call to pick up Harry from school. He was suspended for two weeks and faced potential assault charges. Unfortunately, Jack witnessed the altercation and insisted on intervening to aid his brother. He ended up losing two teeth but earned Harry's admiration for his support. Upon bringing her sons home, Alina met us at the door. Harry immediately confronted his mother for not being honest with them about the events from years ago. Alana remained silent, offering no defense as her eldest son expressed his anger. Sensing the tension, I took Jack to the dentist, leaving them alone to address their issues. Jack didn't seem too bothered by his missing teeth, but I was concerned about the impending dental expenses. When we returned home, Elena was nowhere to be found. 
Her car remained parked, but she had left without a word or explanation, leaving Harry bewildered. I took a week off from work to try to calm things down and sort out the situation. Elena's parents and sister maintained their silence toward me. After a week passed with no word from Elena, her whereabouts or intentions remained a mystery. Bella and I made the decision to move into the house together. Initially, sharing a bed felt awkward, but surprisingly, the boys accepted the arrangement more easily than I had anticipated. One day, while I was at work, all traces of Elena or anything connected to her vanished from the house. I didn't inquire about what Bella did with it, nor did I have any desire to know. Bella seamlessly assumed all the responsibilities that Elena had once handled. To simplify things, I provided her with a few credit cards. It was peculiar to realize that I trusted my mistress more than my wife. I sold Alina's car and purchased a new one for Bella. Family gatherings became less tense with this new arrangement. Bella was happier, and my mother was overjoyed. Harry and Jack experienced no further issues at school, and Derek's nephew never returned. Despite these improvements, I was still legally married. After two months of uncertainty regarding Elena's whereabouts, I decided to take action and reported her as a missing person to the police. However, I framed it as a case of a runaway spouse, knowing I could use the report as evidence when filing for divorce, citing abandonment as grounds. I patiently waited two more months before submitting the divorce papers, aware that a year of absence was necessary for the divorce to be granted. I was planning ahead, strategizing for the future. Gradually, life in the household settled into a new rhythm. Harry and Jack adapted well to Bella's presence. Though they never referred to her as mom, preferring to call her Bella, our dynamics improved significantly. We began to resemble a family more than we had in years. Then, unexpectedly, I received the final decree of divorce, freeing me from my marriage. Two weeks later, Bella and I journeyed to Elton and exchanged vows, solidifying our bond. With Harry graduating from school and joining the Air Force, and Jack enrolling in meat cutting school in Toledo a year later, changes came swiftly. Before we knew it, Bella and I found ourselves alone. Despite our readiness to move forward, we never received any word from Alina, leaving her whereabouts and intentions shrouded in mystery. Mom and Dad made the move to Ocala, urging us all to promise to visit them at least twice a year. With no strong ties keeping us in reading, Bella and I decided to return to our roots in Philly. Jack, after graduating from his school, found a position at a prestigious butcher shop in Westchester. We cherished the moments we spent with him, as he always had something delightful to share whenever we met. A year later, we found ourselves attending one of Bella's niece's weddings, a grand affair typical of Italian celebrations in the city of brotherly love. The event was teeming with guests, mostly family members, along with a sprinkling of opportunists seeking free drinks and food. Nevertheless, the festivities were lively and abundant. During the evening, I noticed Bella displaying a hint of unease, her gaze wandering across the dance floor on several occasions. Though I tried to spot what had caught her attention, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, when she excused herself to visit the restroom, a sense of apprehension washed over me. Observing her as she made her way to the back of the hall, I noticed her meeting up with one of her old friends. Amidst the chatter and socializing, Bella's behavior caught my attention. Instead of heading to the restroom as she initially claimed, she approached one of Luca's assistants, her gestures directed towards a nearby table. There sat three guys and three girls, looking like they were trying a bit too hard to impress. The girls were adorned in flashy attire, giving off an air of ostentation. Returning to our table, Bella wore a thoughtful yet composed expression. Marco, we've got a slight issue. I gathered that much from your little reconnaissance mission. Care to elaborate? You need to stay calm. In a few minutes, one of the guys from Janet's table will come over here and try to provoke you. What do you mean, provoke me? He'll likely say some offensive things about me to get a rise out of you. When you react, they'll jump in and attack you. And I'm supposed to just let that happen. Temporarily, yes. Wait until Thomas and the others are ready. You might need to fend off one of them, but that should be the extent of it. What exactly do you mean by play along with him? Let him insult me and then agree with him. If he calls me a prostitute, 
ask him how much he's willing to pay. Something like that. But whatever you do, don't let him provoke you. What's all this about? Why are these guys targeting me? Take a look at Janet's table. Okay. Focus on the woman with the short platinum hair. Got her. Look closer. Whoa, that's Elena. What's she doing here? Elena's boyfriend is somehow connected to the bride. It seems she's still holding a grudge against you, and she orchestrated this setup to get back at you when she saw you were here. I guess she's out for revenge. While you and Luca's crew handle things here, Janet and I will have a chat with Elena in the ladies' room. It's not going to be pleasant. I felt uneasy about the situation unfolding. This was supposed to be a joyous occasion, a memorable night for the bride. It wasn't right for a couple of thugs to spoil it. When I noticed Elena's companion rising from his seat, I stood up and made a polite excuse to the table. Bella shot me a curious glance, but seemed to grasp the situation. Nonchalantly, I strolled over to the side fire exit, where people were stepping out for a smoke. The boyfriend nodded to his companions, signaling them to follow. Unseen by them, three men emerged from the back of the bar, each wielding a Louisville slugger kept behind the counter. Outside, about half a dozen individuals were puffing away by the fire exit. With a firm tone, I instructed them to leave, and surprisingly, they complied without resistance. There must have been an urgency in my voice. I walked a short distance away and paused, then turned back. The trio emerged, initially smiling, but their expressions quickly soared as the door clicked shut behind them. Their grins vanished upon spotting the three bat-wielding figures and the bride's father waiting for them. The altercation ended swiftly, lasting no more than 30 seconds, and I didn't have to resort to violence. Apologies for any inconvenience caused to you and your family on this special evening. I expressed, feeling like a character straight out of a mob movie. Thank you for handling it discreetly, he responded, shaking my hand before returning to his daughter's side. After expressing gratitude to Luca's men for their assistance, I went inside to locate Bella. They remained behind to tidy up the aftermath. Sensing it was time to depart, I couldn't find Bella, and Elena's table was now deserted. Jack, having caught wind of the disturbance, approached me at the bar with some of his friends. Dad, what's going on? My initial instinct was to keep quiet, but it failed. Your mother was here with her new boyfriend. I don't need to hear more than that, he replied with a grin, ordering a beer from the bartender. We engaged in conversation about other topics for about an hour. Eventually, Bella appeared, looking a bit disheveled. Where have you been? I asked. She smirked mischievously. Janet and I had to accompany your ex-wife to the hospital. She wasn't feeling well. Jack and I couldn't help but chuckle. Marco, can we head home now? It was a long, eventful night, but filled with laughter. We never encountered Elena again. Bella and I remain happily together in our old neighborhood. Life couldn't be better. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.